uh, let's put our get ready, get ready. I know because we're in the heat, it's everything takes about two or three seconds longer. So just get ready to bring your hands up and put your hands together. Let's give a, a bit of a uh, let's get some energy up for our panelists who are here right now and introduce them. So our wonderful panel here, let's give them a round of applause. Yes. Take the time out of a busy, busy performance schedule to be here and chat with you and share what they love to do. So let's start here, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, maybe talk about who you are, where you're from, and which project right now you're collaborating in. Does that make sense? Why don't we start with Farshad here? Sounds good. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Farshad Bassi, also known as DJ Bassi, part of quite a few different projects actually, so this is a very appropriate topic to talk about. Uh, where am I from? I guess I'm from Vancouver, uh, pretty much been there most of my life. Involved in the electronic music scene since the 90s. Uh, and, you know, I guess I started bedroom DJing in 95, got into like my first gig in 99, started the promotions company back then, and 17 years later, here we are, and uh, still enjoying it. So, that's me. Nice. Who's next? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nancy Lee. Um, I also go by Witch Nancy for my DJ uh, project. Um, I'm part of a few projects as well, different differing kind of scales. So I'm here with uh, Chapel Sound. We've just played here until 6 a.m. last night. Um, <laughs> so I'm a little bit tired right now. Um, and um, so I work with Chapel Sound. Chapel Sound is a like electronic music and art collective based in Vancouver. Um, we're entering our five year uh, this September. Um, we throw uh, DIY parties. Uh, we p uh, put on. We provide like a platform for emerging electronic music producers. Um, we also like do live streaming for music as well. Um, I'm also part of. Uh, I'm also like a filmmaker, so I have a video production company, and I work with various producers, uh, direct uh, DOPs, and things like that to produce my film projects. Mostly working on music videos at this point, so I work with artists, uh, musicians a lot. And then I also do um, interactive um, art installations, so I have a couple projects in the realm of like, like I have a swing installation where it's like the swings are um, interactive, uh, you swing on the swings and it controls the audio-visual parameters in the room. Um, so I just came back from a tour uh, in Mumbai uh, for that project. I also work in the realm of virtual reality, uh, specifically um, with dance films, so I'm currently working with the National Film Board uh, producing and directing the film for that. Um, yeah, that's just some projects. <laughs> no Nancy, have you ever been lazy? Uh, ever? Uh, I don't know, maybe when I was a teenager. Okay. Got <laughs> bored of that and got busy. When right. I used to be a stoner. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who we got way down there? Uh, hi. <clears throat> I have a really, really bad voice today because I also was playing until 6 a.m. last night. <laughs> Didn't sleep. <laughs> Um, my name is Isis Graham, I'm from Calgary, I also go as Iset, and I'm um, currently working on the biggest, biggest project that's taking up most of my life right now is uh, the Upper Electronic Music Conference, that we organized with this lovely fellow over here, <laughs> Andrew Williams, and another guy named Matt Calgary. Sounds and, like a collaboration. It's a big collaboration, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great. And then I also run a record label called Substation Recordings with my partner Casey McMeekin, who clearly didn't show up today. <laughs> Twitter! <laughs> yeah. No, he's probably just lying on the dirt somewhere. <laughs> but, um, what else do I do? I mean, I've, I've been throwing parties in Calgary since 1997, and DJing since 99, and organized versions with uh, the excursions.fm guys, and I do all kinds of everything, <laughs> all the stuff in Calgary. For me to you, which, yeah, let's give her a big one, please. So, these, these uh, three wonderful people here are very, very active uh, and are responsible for a lot of things that you, maybe you see or attend or go to. And if not, uh, they have touched people that are doing things that you see, attend, or go to. Or perhaps you also worked with them, been so lucky to do so. We're very lucky to have them here. So again, one more time for our three panelists, and then we're going to get into it. Cool. Collaboration. Collaboration is very, very simply, um, I think, working with more than yourself, right? Now you can get really metaphysical and go, we're all one, so is there true collaboration because you are me and I am you. But that's too early in the night, although we were just following the psychedelic workshop, so maybe some of you are already there. But collaboration 
is working with someone else or other people. And it's very, very simple. Now, whether that's a DJ duo or whether it's a large organization working with another, what area, what project currently are you, would you all say you're collaborating the most? And how's that going? What are you doing right now where collaboration is a big key? Uh, well, I'll go first. I think the biggest one I think is the Alberta Electronic Music Conference. It's a, it's a massive project, probably the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, and it definitely requires more than just one brain, one person, and one, one set of ideas. How is your collaboration partner to work with? Andrew is the best. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call him my Edmonton husband. <laughs> Which is really fabulous because, um, you know, I place full trust and faith in everything that he does, and I don't have to be concerned about, you know, if he says he's going to do something, you know, it'll happen at some point. And I feel like that it's the trust aspect in the collaboration is really, really essential. Because um, as I'm sure everyone in this room has experienced, you know that thing when you do a team project at school and it's like, just you doing the thing. <laughs> that's what I try, I, I don't want to do any more of those. Right. I'm sure we can all create, but that's not the funnest time. Was the trust immediate or was it built over time? Sorry? Was the trust immediate? Or did it build over time? Did you have to earn it? <laughs> I, I don't know, Andrew, did you feel like you had to earn it? <laughs> Uh, we, were, we, connected pretty quick. we did. I just loved Andrew. It was like when you see your favorite teddy bear on the shelf. In the uh, Andrew should just call him teddy bear. <laughs> I'm okay with that. He's All pretty right. nice. He's a pretty nice guy. Yeah. And our other guy that's, that works with us, Matt, is also really nice. But they're like, I mean, I think in terms of anyone putting up with anyone's shit, it's them putting up with me because <laughs> I'm pretty in control and I'm pretty, pretty powerful when I'm trying to do stuff. <laughs> nice. Uh, it's needed. Leaders, leaders need to push things forward. Uh, where else have we got some powerful collaborations going on right now where you're super active, maybe right before you came to Base Coast? I totally forgot to mention my biggest project that's happening at the moment. Um, so I'm working on, um, an it's called Current, a Pacific Northwest Feminist Electronic Arts Symposium for the end of July, uh, July 28th to 30th in Vancouver. <laughs> Uh, it's a pretty big project. I totally, Sounds amazing. I forgot to mention it until I mentioned your conference. Um, uh, and Steph Parks is also um, helping us with the project. Um, so that's kind of like an inter-organizational uh, collaboration between like multiple uh, groups of people with our, the venue Vancouver Art and Leisure, uh, with Gennaro Sound, which is like a uh, kind of like all-female, like non-binary um, music label based in Vancouver. Check, uh, check them out. They're super rad. Um, and um, so, it's, so yeah, we're working with multiple things. You know, we, we also have like partnerships with like Discorder, with like different different kinds of partnerships to kind of like uh, fulfill the different needs that we might need um, in order to kind of make this. Um, uh, the symposium happened, and also partnerships with like multiple crews from Vancouver uh, to kind of facilitate the different workshops. Nice. Current. <laughs> Check it out. Coming up soon. What are the dates? Uh, July 28th and 30th, uh, to 30th. Yeah. It's happening nice. in Vancouver. Yeah. Wait. Arshan. Um, in terms of uh, my, I guess my most active, a lot of my collaborations have been around. I mean, I, I DJ. Yeah. Promote, so my main promotion company is a collaboration with two partners, and it's been it's been very interesting. I mean, in terms of you know, we, we met and we were friends first, and then when we started, uh, uh, you know, we, we kind of recognized that each of them brought in a, a certain unique skill set to the table. So it was sort of, I guess, you know, sort of right from the start, uh, uh, there was a lot of synergy. None of us really overlapped to, to the other uh, person's area, right? Like, for example, I brought the artistic side. One of the partners is, you know, really good with finance, and the other person's really good with people and just, you know, marketing and that kind of stuff. And then the combination of those unique skill sets, you know, is what's really made us successful over the years. Uh, but aside from that, on the musical side, I've had a number of different DJ production collaborations, and my current one is with Glenn, and we, uh, we co-host, uh, well, we do a number of things. One of them is we have a weekly radio show. We it's live once a month. We actually hosted it at uh, the cantina this morning until it was like 10 to 12.30. And then we also broadcast it live, and you know, we have the podcast and all that other stuff. But we also work on tracks, so we collaborate on producing music under an alias, Billy Manelli, uh, you know, and, and our produ that's our production alias, and we also do our DJing stuff under just our own names of that, so you can win. 
Uh, and then, of course, we DJ uh, at quite a few different events around town. So those are, I mean, there's the artistic collaborations as well as the production collaborations. And within the production collaboration, also one of the keys to our success has been collaborating with other promotion groups. Um, you know, so I mean, we, you know, the, the most one of the most successful events that we had that ran for 13 years was successful because we collaborated with Lida crew and Shaw DJs that were very key in the soundproof crew. And a lot of crews uh, that were up and coming in Vancouver at the time that we collaborated with them and it helped both the art crews and, and theirs to, to succeed here. Uh, so it's been very powerful in your journey. Hi guys in the back, we can hear you up here. Nice to see you, welcome. Really nice to see you. We're glad you're here collaborating with us uh, at this workshop. Uh, nice answer, Farsha. I wanted to ask you all where um, where do collaborations come from for, for, for you? Are they organic within, say, pre-existing friend groups or networks? Are they linked to brand goals? Are they linked to growth goals? Is, where does it come from for you? Is it kind of organic and what's right around you? Or are you actually looking outside of where you're already working uh, to put projects together? Well, I mean, for me, projects are usually accidents <laughs> or like random ideas. You like, guys all know you're at the rave and you're like, we should throw a music conference. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like a great idea. Or, or, you know, a random person will come to you and be like, you'd be really good for this. Or, you know, I think in terms of the things happening, the different types of collaborations, they do come from all angles. I've definitely had ideas where I'm like, I need a person that can do this. I want to find that guy. <laughs> but it's, it's less, that doesn't happen in my life as much as random situations. I'm like, hey, yeah, I like you. Let's throw a party. <laughs> and it builds from there. And then it just goes from there. So I think it depends on the medium of the collaboration, right? Like with anything that's to do with event production, um, I feel like that kind of collaboration in general is a lot more spontaneous. Um, you know, it's like, yeah, let's throw a music festival. Okay, like who can do what? Let, let's delegate and let's see who we can book, you know? Yes. So those kinds of collaborations in general are a lot more spontaneous. But as a filmmaker, you know, my filmmaking kind of collaborations are a little bit more intentional. You know, like if I, as a writer, director, I have, an, I have an idea, I'm gonna go seek out a DOP or a producer or someone who has similar aesthetics uh, as I do and similar visions or uh, similar kind of, you know, vibes that I would have. So in terms of like those kind of collaborations, I would generally like seek out, make a call out and, and you know, check out different people and be quite intentional with uh, that type of collaboration. And in terms of like my interdisciplinary art uh, collaboration, those ones are a little bit different because it's kind of like design, it's uh, lots of uh, research and development. So those collaborations are, like they're organic in some ways, but it, there's like all lots of um, I guess like there's a, it's so much research rather than making a spectacle happen. It's like spending time in the studio figuring out whether this technology is going to work or not, doing that kind of research. So I feel like that type of collaboration like could be organic, but a lot of it is like quite rigid in some ways. That like we have to like spend this, this much time in a studio to like make this interface work for this show that will be coming up in the next year or whatnot. Okay, so it's a combo of both of you as well. But some of it is quite strategic in where you might not know uh, the person, but you know they have something uh, that would add to the project. Yeah, I, I generally allow quite a bit of room for experimentation and for like some like little bit of chaos to happen. Like I do, because I do do the cold calls as well, like I will straight up Instagram a person and be like, yo, I love your shit, like let's collab. And has stuff come out of that, from that kind of approach? Absolutely. Cool, good to know. Farsha. Um, I guess for my, I'm thinking in terms of the, uh, the artistic side, uh, those, there, there, there's always an organic element to it as well as a purpose and sort of complementary, right? So I mean, my current collaboration with Glenn, uh, when we first met, I was into music that was more, how would you say, fun. Whereas Glenn was like really particular, minimal techno, minimal house stuff that's really stripped out. Oh, no fun at all. So you know, and we, were from, we were coming at it from a complete uh, opposite direction. But we had that synergy and there was that, you know, sort of organic number of friends and there was that, that, that initial, you know, hey, I, we could work together and we also complement each other really well. So that collaboration worked out really well because I brought certain aspects to the production duo and to the DJ elements that, you know, he didn't have and vice versa. So as a result, now I really like 
you know, weird minimal techno and he likes really fun music. So Farsh, um, you've become <laughs> you've become no fun. And you just admitted it on Facebook. Kind of live. The middle of <laughs> yeah, maybe true. Um, and, and then the, the partnership as the you know the promotion side as well. I mean, you know, I was friends with my partners first, but then we each of them brought a certain skill set as I mentioned that was complementary so that really helped the the overall team so that you know we were you know strong but not overstepping each other's boundaries and that worked out really well. So if you can recognize what the strengths of your partners are and then sort of you know, help them grow instead of just sort of everyone trying to do everything, that always works out to your advantage. Okay, so here's a follow-up question to that, which I think we've all been leading into, is how important are roles and knowing yours and knowing what you're, like, can you, could you define your own role, even if it was almost like in a D&D &D metaphor, like I'm a 27th level paladin that's really good at administration, you know what I mean? Like, what is your role? Do you know your function? <laughs> um, I think in each of the different projects, the my role is definitely emerging. It's because sometimes it's really clear, you know, whether I'm, oh, I'm definitely the director of this project, or oh, I'm just the graphic designer in this project. Oh, I'm just the person that writes the simplex in this project. But then in some some things, like with the conference, <laughs> Andrew's like, no, you're the boss. <laughs> I don't want to be the boss. You be the boss. <laughs> no, you're the boss. Okay, well, okay, fine. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think I naturally gravitate towards those kinds of administrative control in the world is because those are the strengths. So when I actually stopped, I've noticed in my life, I'm not really crazy to the fact that when I take on stuff, I need to go, okay, what is this, what is this? Okay, do I have to sell the liquor, throw this, design the flyer, and then do all the admin? No, I only want to do the admin. So I'm actually starting to eliminate things that I do just by being straight up, but no, I only want to administrate this project. But just, really great for me. <laughs> so just to reiterate, you're often the boss. I'm often the boss. Yeah, okay. We're clear on that? I think we're good. <laughs> Nancy, how about you? What's your role if you had to give yourself a title? Um, a director. <laughs> no um, boss. Um, yeah, so for like events, like all the Chapel Sound stuff, um, I do handle a little bit more of the admin business side of things. I don't, I don't like, um, I'm not like the boss, the boss. I do think that we do have kind of a system that organically has emerged over the last five years that certain people uh, step in to do certain tasks. But I kind of do, do, I do like oversee and like do, do a lot of delegation. Um, mm -hmm. And I do find like knowing like your roles and having clearly defined roles um, is important. At least like having one associated like task assigned to like one person so that they there's no confusion what they're gonna they should be doing. And you can you know roles are always uh, malleable. You can always change and adapt it throughout throughout the project. But I think it's important to have certain kind of roles and or figure out your con kind of like your contract or your agreement with each other. Like are we talking about like a I'm gonna be a director and you guys are gonna be like uh, I'm going to delegate tasks to you guys. It's going to be that kind of hierarchy, or is it going to be more of like uh, like a democratic kind of like consensus type of thing? And I find different kinds of collaboration warrants different type of like uh, agreements between groups of people. Mm -hmm. Definitely, probably depends on the number and the makeup of the group as well. Yeah, and I think, and also again, the medium too. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, to I agree with all the points made here, and it is. It's really important to define the roles and responsibilities within your group, as well as I've also seen working with other promoters. We've got a number of events where, uh, you know, you get together with say two or three other promoters, and nobody really talks about you know who's responsible for what, and then as a result, nothing. Everyone is not really pulling their way. Nothing's really getting done. So even when you're working with, both within your own group as well as with other groups, you need to define what each group is responsible for, or what each person is responsible for, and really trying to also see okay, well, who you know who's got the skill sets in a particular area, and, and just saying okay, you know what, I'm good at this, I'm going to take this on, and then it's my responsibility rather than everyone trying to do the same thing. And that's happened also a number of times within our own small group that you know we haven't really clearly defined those uh, those tasks and responsibilities. Three runners running the same race. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and with, so with the, yeah, and like I've seen it within within our group. And then also outside the group, and you know, I remember there was this one New Year's party we threw, and you know, like nothing was getting done. Like who's making the flyer? What's happening with the sound? No one really was like pulling their weight. And then what you realize is that 
said, well, there's no leadership because all three are sort of equal partners, but no one is really like stepping it up to, to drive the promotion or the production. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, we, we hadn't really agreed to what everybody's supposed to be doing, which uh, created it. No communication. You're leading right into the, the follow-up questions, which is great. If you're just joining us or if you're just uh, jumping on Facebook Live, this is the Groundwork Panel talk on collaboration, the power of collaboration, live from Base Coast Music Festival. Uh, everybody having a great Base Coast? Yeah. Uh, speaking of collaboration, this festival is a shining example of that, I believe. Um, I want to take a quick poll of the room so we can uh, figure out who's here and, and what we're doing here and why we're here so we get the most out of uh, the talk we're about to have. So who here in the room is already producing events of any type? Events where people come and uh, partake in something. Yeah, great. Who would like to? Who isn't yet or has in the past but would like to? Yeah, totally, right? Cool. Uh, who's got creative projects, artistic projects where you're working with other people? In any form, in any media, right? Uh, who wants to do more of that? Who would like to invigorate and make that even more powerful? Yeah, most of us, right? I think that's why we're here. So thank you for being here today. I hope you get something out of the panel. Three wonderful, wonderful panelists. And this is giving them a little break uh, because they all DJ technically today, meaning after midnight, and yet they're still here. So can we give them another hand for being here? I'd also like to just take a moment to have a shout out to uh, the team, the Brownwork team that's here. We have Steph Parks back here. Uh, we have Nick Collinet, who is, is hiding right in the middle. Uh, and helping us out, uh, the wonderful Sam Steele, running a bunch of cameras. And the wonderful Nathan Spoon, running a bunch of cameras. And all of you lovely people, so thank you for being here today. Let's have a great time tonight. Now, why not do it all yourself? <laughs> Why not just be a lone wolf, a maverick, and be the rock star, and do it all yourself? Because you'll end up in the hospital. Uh -huh. <laughs> like quite literally, you'll, you'll, you'll burn out. And like, I mean, I've been living in a situation of burnout for probably a couple of years, and it's actually I'm starting to only get into, into control because of my ability, because I've only become recently self-aware of how much I was burning the candle at all ends. And, uh, I mean, can you hear my voice right now? <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. I don't know, I like to have a good time. But, you know, if you're doing too much, you can't do anything really well also, and you have to find a balance. And I don't believe that life is balanced, and I don't think life is fun when things are always balanced, but definitely with working in the events and production, when, when things are escalating, like I call it an escalating contract, when things are like this, definitely need to go, okay, well, where am I going to be in month six on the escalator? I'm there on that escalator, not taking on any more projects, no more things. Don't spread yourself in. But when you're when you're the boss of everything, you have to think for yourself, and then you have to think for everyone else. And then they, they become codependent on you, and then start depending on you to think for them. And then you're just like, what do you mean you don't know the answer? Of course you do. <laughs> it's, I don't know, very simple stuff, but don't uh, burn the candle at both ends. That would be my biggest advice. Mm. Yeah. All right, so stay healthy in a sense. Stay healthy. Keep, it, keep you healthy and sane. Don't, <laughs> collaborators, don't do it all yourself. Ask for help. Ask for help. Ask for help. Let people help you. How many people in the audience would actually like love to be asked for help by someone else on their project? Like, right? Totally. Yeah, okay, good. Just checking. Um, for me, it's kind of uh, like in order for me to produce a piece of work, whether an event, a film, a piece of art, installation, at the quality and scale that I envision it to be, it has to be collaborative. Um, and like, I, I just don't like, maybe, I think it's possible to do solo projects. Like, you know, a lot of music producers, they, bedroom producers, they can create amazing albums, like, just solely by themselves. Uh, but like, for me, the type of things that I want to do is like I want to be like engaging with people within a space so there are some elements of like being physically present that is mandatory so when you have to be physically present in a space you can't really be present at multiple it's just physically not it's impossible so I think you just have to kind of surrender to that fact and be like okay well I can't possibly do all this and there's and I think you have it's important to recognize that there are so many talented people out there there's so many people that are better than what you uh, 
you, uh, they're better than you at certain tasks. You know, like they're just, there's, they're a graph, I'm not a graphic designer, you know, there are tons of plenty of like talented graphic designers. And, you know, like I think as like a cultural producer, it's your job to kind of seek out the people who are talented at what they do and throw them the work, you know, if you, if you got opportunities. I think if you are in a position where you have the ability to offer other people like creative or like work opportunities, I, like why not? Like why, why would you do it yourself when you don't have to? Do you, do you get a kick out of kind of enabling other people's talents and seeing that emerge or seeing the result of it? Yeah, totally. I like it's just it's so inspiring to see someone like do something that they didn't used to do and try something new and like and be really good at it too. You know, I think you know it's ben it's beneficial for everybody to kind of see people around you grow because I feel like you know seeing somebody else doing a task like you know like with Chapel Sound like we never used to do events and we did small scale like house parties and now we do like multi room like like raves that like with five hundred people that would come. And like from like a five person living room jam to like a five hundred person party, you know, that scale up is like there's quite a bit and in order in the roles that we needed to fulfill to in order to make those kind of parties happen, you know, there was quite a few roles that we had to kind of like give people work for, you know. That's a million percent growth. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Persian? Uh, what do I think? Why, why not just do it all yourself? Uh, why not be king in your own little kingdom? It's, it's, so it's interesting. I actually was going to ask the question, but first of all, the answer that is that, well, I really enjoy teamwork. I enjoy working with people, and one of my things that some, some people say maybe it's your fault is I don't like doing things on my own, so I, whenever I'm going to do a project or something, I always be like, hey, who wants to join me on this thing? Let's all do this thing together. And when we started Mixed Med Productions, there were actually six of us. I was like, hey, you DJ, you DJ, you're all four of us DJ, you promote this all do this thing together because it's a lot more fun, right? And that comes from that collaborative, like I think in all of us, that spirit is in us, right? There are people out there that aren't like that. They're just like, this is my thing, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be the boss, and I'm gonna hire people. Is that collaboration? And I think that's the question wow. I have for you. I mean, is, yeah. is that considered collaboration? Or is it a job? Right, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think we all have that collaborative spirit. We're like, hey, you know, we have this all work together, create a community, bring this stuff together. You have in this skill set, I've got this thing, you know, and it, it'd be nice to work together. But you know, that's I think uh, uh, not everyone is is that way. Can you each uh, think for a moment and uh, about one one thing that working collaboratively has brought you, like something you could never have done on your own? Maybe the most shiny example of that, whether recent or in the past, something that you accomplished, uh, either it's a, whether it's a pet goal or just a really cool thing uh, that came could only have come from working collectively. Just, uh, I know, I'm gonna keep stalling for a second, keep that in your head, uh, maybe find that moment where you just felt flipping great after uh, something was done. What was that thing? For me, it would definitely have to be the conference. Yeah. It was a big, I mean, it was such a big production compared to just throwing a party where you have two turntables, I mean, you have tech, in three rooms and you've got, you know, you're not just booking 10 DJs to play for 10 hours, you've got 65 speakers, this, that, the other thing, tech for every single person, different mic setups, different, I need different plugins, and there's so much more to it, it's so much more um, technical and detailed, and the, I mean, there there was moments in our first year where I was like, yeah, I can, I can, I can do this by myself, <laughs> and we were there, and I was like, no, <laughs> there's no way, this is absolutely collaborative. And um, I think the most rewarding part was was watching people learn and have these skills that they didn't have, and they merge in these new roles. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I actually am really good at running a soundboard. And then they become interested in that, or like supporting them to develop a new interest. It's really cool to see stuff like that happen. You talk about it, just quickly diving a little deeper with that, you talk about a lot of the bits and pieces that need, and all of the thought and planning that needs to go into it, but did you think like, did you wake up being good at that, or did you get good at it because you needed to? And I use yeah. that for people who are like maybe scared to start something, or like, well, I'm no good at this, so I'm not even gonna try doing this project or goal, but we don't start out great at it, do we? No, no, I think, I think, uh, I've done a lot of things that didn't work out. <laughs> I mean, I think we've all thrown a couple parties where we're like, oh, 
that's a negative number. <laughs> but you know what? You just how many heads through the door? Minus seven. Yeah. I owe you fifty dollars. I only lost seven bucks. <laughs> There's those days, you know. But it's a good feeling. That number gets smaller, and then. You, it gets in the class, and every time you get better, you learn about accounting, or you go, I suck at accounting, I need like Steve in accounting to do accounting. <laughs> and then you delegate that to Steve, and then he goes, okay, listen, you can't spend 200 bucks on lollipops. But can like, oh, we? Can we? Can't we, though? Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's, what's, uh, what's something you could not have done if you weren't working collaboratively? That is a really good memory for you. Just one. <laughs> uh, Pick the one that's right for you right now. I feel like my life is this, it's just all collaboration. Um, I guess the one that, I guess the most recent one uh, would be, well, like, obviously the Travel Sound shows and stuff like that, those are like, it's just, as the ball gets rolling. Um, that's always a good time for me. But most recent one is I just got back from Mumbai on Wednesday night. Um, and uh, I was there for uh, a new media art show and to showcase my interactive swing set. So I have these two swings that have the sensors on them that control audiovisual parameters. And that swing set has been in kind of development for the last like two and a half, three years. And to be able to see that swing set go on tour, it was just a, such an amazing feeling. And that swing set itself is a collaboration between me and my collaborator, Kieran Bumber. Kieran Bumber does all of the coding um, out of all of the hardware building and out of all of the sound design and I build the swing sets and I work with the visual element uh, of that installation. So that's a good, it's, it was like a totally like complementary skill set type collaboration where she kind of was able to offer all the programming and sound design and I was able to offer all the physical installation and visual uh, side of things. And to able to yeah, to be able to see that like on tour and people from like India engaging with it and like getting it and like being super interested in it is just like mind blowing. And it's a super satisfying um, kind of like experience to be able to see people. Nice. And a big shout out to your partner Karen Bumper on that one. Yeah, yeah. Let's do yeah, yeah, let's do it. Oh, side note, Kieran Bumper. I don't know Kieran, but it's an awesome name. Kieran Bumper. Like, plays minimal techno, I'm sure. No fun, right, Sean? 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 Um, I don't think any of the successes that I've had would have been possible without collaboration, to be honest. Uh, but the most memorable one, memorable one was probably a New Year's party we did a few years ago. Just uh, those who remember the Lotus, it was a you know multi nightclub complex. There were three clubs in there. Uh, we threw a New Year's party there, and that was sold out. Probably eight to nine hundred people. But on the same night, we had another party at this other venue, uh, Chapel Arts. Again, I don't know if you guys remember that. Two two rooms in there, so there was probably five six hundred people there. So between the two of them, we were running two New Year's parties. Uh, you know, almost two thousand people, but like none of it, it would probably would have been possible had we not collaborated with other promoters or DJs and all bring everybody together uh, to do that. Like I mean, and I think about that every time I mean, do a party and I go to that and you know, I'm like, wow, this thing is is amazing. But none of this would have been possible if I wasn't collaborating with my partners and with everybody else involved. And I'm always really, really grateful for that. Nice. Yeah. Um, for myself and all, I've I think I tried to do things solo for a good decade. Nothing worked. A couple of years ago, I, I met Nick and Steph, and uh, this idea came about. And like we said, we're two years deep, and have gone from a 90-person party to a 500-person party when we do our, th our things as well. So it's um, I can't. This is a, it's an almost an emotional thing for me to begin to open up and be uh, part of a team. <laughs> where, where, now let's get, let's get real, because this is all happy and celebratory, and, and yay, we all feel good about our teddy bears, but, um, or our administration, or Steve in accounting, but where, um, where have you had a collab or project, and you don't have to name names, in fact, it's probably great if you don't, but where have you had a collab or project fall absolutely flat, and what did you learn from that? What do you take away from that experience? We'll get out of this in, a, in like as quick as we can, but I think it's an important point. For me, it's definitely a, um, a music production project. I, I, uh, music production with people for me is really difficult. I find opening up my process and revealing it, I'm really insecure about it, first of all. So when I allow someone into my process, it takes it's a big leap for me personally, but. Um, <laughs> 
if I can't also keep up with them and they're so skilled beyond where I'm at, then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm never going to be able to keep up with you. Um, and I've had a few projects just fall flat completely where we just, we'd be like, yeah, I'll get that baseline done and then it just never would happen. <laughs> but what we should have done is got in the studio together and just did it. But we, we clearly weren't artistically connected. We didn't have that like fire creatively. So I, I have to say like probably, I'm not, I won't say 50% of my collaborative musical projects have been f failures, but that basically happened. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's watching, I'm sure she still loves you. Um, what I'm pulling out of that, though, is that perhaps uh, a remedy to that, or when something is faltering, is to actually get in the presence of each other and be able to look each other in the eye and yeah. you respond emotionally. Is that true? That's Yeah, and that's what I mean. So for me, creating music is really, really personal. So I think when those projects fall flat, what I learned is that if I'm not willing to let that person in and do that, then maybe I should be doing that. It's not their fault at all, you know? And it's not that the collaboration technically failed. It's just that sure. I'm probably not willing to let them in. <laughs> it's good to know yourself. It's, yeah, you have to be really self-aware as an artist. All right, uh, thank you for sharing that. This is brave stuff, seriously. Who's next? Uh, I like that you said, like, yeah, it's not necessarily a failure, um, it's just discovering yourself in some ways. Like, I, I kind of view my collaborations like that, too, like, because you never really walk away from, like, a collaboration that didn't output a result as, like, a failure, right? Because the process is still there, and you've kind of experienced the process. So, you know, I, I guess, like, uh, to kind of uh, rephrase, like, like, in terms of, like, a recent or a collaboration that did not result in the kind of final project that we wanted to have done. Uh, like my VR my VR dance film that I've been working on uh, since last May. Um, I had a, I got brought on a project by a collaborator. Um, he's also a filmmaker and he it was his idea and he got me on the project and some things about his life and his priorities shifted um, and he exited the project but did not exit gracefully uh, for the project. I kind of like ghosted on the project which it was a bit difficult for me, and I was a little bit in shock about the whole process, and I didn't think, I didn't expect that to happen at all. But I think, as like a collaborator, like you know, like I was already invested in the project enough that, I, and he was kind of like whatever about it. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead with the project. Are you cool with it without you? And he, he was okay with it. So I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna have to like let it go and just like continue on the project uh, on my own. And I found like two other collaborators that are like wonderful, and now we have funded from the NFB, so I have no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> what did you What did you take away from that experience? Is there a, a kind of a learning you take forward into future projects? Absolutely. I think the main thing when collaborations don't really go how you pan out to be is it comes down to uh, poor communication and also unaligned like values, work ethic, and schedules. Um, I think an unaligned kind of goal, like like goals that don't quite align. So I think those are the kind of elements that create, you know, a collaboration that may fail. And then now in hindsight, I'm like, oh, those like I saw the signs of that happening, you know, during the collaboration, but I didn't realize it. But I guess now going away, that's when I jump into a new collaboration. I kind of, well, I kind of do like a talk, like a, we we talk it out. We're like, okay, so where what are our roles? Like, let's kind of just come up with like a agreement like how do you want to check in with each other with this collaboration like what are your boundaries with the collaboration like what are your schedules for the next year so we can kind of like plot and schedule our days out for this collaboration so I kind of like go into it with just like an open calendar and like an open book and be like and just like be completely transparent and be like okay these are the shit I'm, this is the things that these are the things I've been dealing with in my own life right now so just like a full disclosure like you know I might not be so available during this period of time um, and I think like being fully transparent also kind of offers because you're vulnerable, right? It makes it easier for people to accept you and to kind of to, to work with you. You know, I think yeah. being able to be uh, vulnerable in a collaboration is key. So I, I like what you said about scheduling, and that's going to lead into to actually where we're going next uh, because it's uh, it's very easy to talk. And it's very easy to talk big, and it's very easy to have big dreams and throw a lot of big dreams uh, even up on the whiteboard and actually write it down. But if you don't have the time to do it, because six months of the year I go down to, you know, somewhere and I'm a, a practicing animal husbandry with condors because that's my passion. <laughs> I don't have time to to like put on a music festival with you, do I? 
because I'm already committed somewhere else. So you have to get to know your, your people, yeah. don't you? And they have to get to know you. Okay, now we're going to come back to that. Um, onward. Here we are. I, I think all the main points have already been mentioned, but I think it's really... We'll start with you next time. <laughs> But, but it's very true. I mean, the, the key things is when you're organizing, uh, in terms of like the production side of things, I mean, where stuff has flat and failed, uh, where I've been involved has been mostly uh, due to lack of definition of roles and responsibilities and leadership, which we talked about earlier. In terms of the artistic projects where there's been failure, um, it's usually been, you know, with the artistic stuff, usually you get excited about something, you're like, hey, let's make a track together, or let's have a DJ duo, or let's do this. But then, as mentioned earlier as well, priorities change, you know, someone starts to change direction in their lives, and then we'll do something else. But then there's that lack of communication, saying, you know what, hey, I'm not interested in doing this anymore. They may not communicate that, and you sort of end up pulling a lot more of the weight than you'd like to, and then it ends up in, in frustration, uh, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff that could have been avoided by simply having a really nice, clean line of communication right up front, saying that, you know, hey, getting into this at any point, if you're not interested, let me know, because I'm still interested in carrying this forward and I'm putting all this effort into it and so you know you should let me know if that's not what you want to do anymore. And I've been in that situation a number of times. Mm -hmm. Do you have one kind of piece of advice you can pull out of? Just communicate and then if yeah. that's that's really it important. Sounded to me like Check in with each other. You should also have a discussion up front about your exit plan. Yeah. Like Just so this doesn't work like can we still be friends? <laughs> you know, can we sign up? If this, is a, if this is a creative project, can we have a contract? Or, you know, if we're not, if, I, if we're starting a promotion company and we're putting money into this and we make money off it, what happens to the money after you disappear? Or like, do we fold the group? Like, what does the brand disappear? Those kinds of things definitely should be discussed up front for sure. And those are hard conversations. Like, that's not easy sure. stuff. <laughs> Because especially when you're starting out, you're kind of uh, pie in the sky and blue sky thinking. Yeah, everything's great, great, great. Everything's great. great. <laughs> and everybody's still friends. Yes, totally. Um, what are the key elements? Where you're, you're hitting on them already. Uh, aligning calendars, great communication, perhaps. Uh, having a plan, having an exit plan. But what are the key tools that you use in collaborations all the time? And I'm throwing that really broad. It can be anything. Like, what, what has to be there? What kind of infrastructure does a collaboration need? Dropbox. So they can be little, Sorry, no, they can really be, love Dropbox. They could be online tools, they could be communication stuff, they could be anything. It's just to speak to what uh, what breathes life into a collaboration. You go first. Uh, so we're gonna start with question. We, we had a big pain point on this one, is that you really need to agree on the methods of communication and you know, so like if it's email and one partner's not checking their email, it's like no, you have an agreement that you know within twenty four hours we're going to use email and you need to respond on that, right? So I think we've, this has been a challenge for me throughout the journey and, you know, we've had to have that conversation. It's like, okay, you know what? We're going to use WhatsApp for conversations that are, when we're doing an event, we need to get in hold of each other. That's what that's for. And then email is going to be used for making decisions and things that are more longer term, but everybody needs to respond within 24 hours. And, you know, and, and this is what you do with each medium. And if that's not agreed upon, uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion. People are going to send messages and all the different, you're going to end up with stuff in SMS, WhatsApp, email. No one really knows what's going on. and, and it's just yes, we really need to agree on your protocol and your tools for sure. Well, is it is it helpful just to again dive into that? Is it helpful to have a searchable uh, like database like of communication? Yeah, is yeah, it like so we can toss keywords in and go back to conversations like three yeah. months ago and find stuff? Is that key? Yeah, something's like yeah. that for sure. So Facebook Messenger, not, not as great. Don't talk to me on your I don't even want to have that. Okay. Although we are a Facebook live stream and we love you. You're great for that. Uh, so thank you for that, Facebook. Onward. We should make it searchable. Yeah. If they make Facebook Messenger searchable, it would be the best messaging yes. platform that there could be. We have channels like Slack. <laughs> yeah, channels. Yeah, yeah. Really good. Facebook's probably mining this data right now and enjoying it as we speak. Listen. So what, what else does that, what other infrastructure do to collaborations need? Communication clearly. Agreement on communication tools. Yes. What else? Um, I'm just going to talk about the, the technical infrastructure. Like, do you guys know Slack? No? Okay. What is Slack, Nancy? Okay, so if you guys are going to get into any kind of like collaborative interdisciplinary event production work or you're going to start a collective, I recommend using Slack. So Slack is a communication platform. I'm not paid by them, by the way, but they're, it's really great. Uh, it's based in Vancouver, actually. Uh, it's a communication platform where you can do team communication and it breaks up into different channels. So like, for example, our Chapel Sound Slack group, we have like 
hashtag meetings, like hashtag general, hashtag uh, like music, hashtag graphics, hashtag like website. So uh, like events, like chapel, like anniversary, um, like the different kind of like commission projects that we have. We have like a rant section, like a random section. So like and all the team communication, because there's so many of us, all of it is organized into its corresponding channel so that you know like when you look at events like okay like we're, we're uh, like talking about our website or graphics right now I just got to click the graphics channel and all the communication and it's also integrated with like Google Drive and Dropbox and all that stuff so you can send files through that as well. What's Google Drive and Dropbox? <laughs> I'm sure you guys have cloud. Does anyone not know what Dropbox is? <coughs> no you do know what it is. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Everyone in here knows let's not spend time on that. Alright. Uh, file sharing services, if you do that. <laughs> Anything else? Is that it? We're good to go now. We have all the infrastructure that our collaboration needs calendar. and we are going to take over the world. Just definitely need a calendar. A calendar. Oh my god, yeah. You need a calendar. I need all the cash every five calendar. minutes. Yeah. A shared group calendar. Any calendars you like? Drop well, Google Calendar. Google Calendar. Google Calendar. Also, you can uh, integrate a calendar into Slack as well. Right. You can really integrate Google Calendar into Slack, so you can have just like a, we have just a calendar channel, and it just reminds you all the things, upcoming events. What's Slack? <laughs> You're gonna have to pay me to repeat it. <laughs> so many brand mentions on Facebook Live. Thank you, Facebook Live. Um, do you have to be friends? No. No. I think you need to respect each other, though. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. But you don't have to be friends. Okay. Yeah. I think some, some of my greatest collaborations that I've done in like, the music industry have been for, for people that aren't friends, actually. And when you say not friends, you mean just not spending yeah, time like, with that person? Yeah, like we're not buds that, you know, you're not, oh, you don't, you know each other in the race scene for 20 years. Yeah, right. Like, that's a friend. But it could be like, oh, I need to outsource this specific thing to this sound company, but I trust this. And, you know, those collaborations are done with different people, different artists, different dancers, different, you know, visual artists. Mm -hmm. Those are always, usually people that I, I've only briefly met, and, and usually those relationships are really good. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have anything to add to that? Farshan. No, I mean, I mean, like, what I mean, the one of the events that comes to mind, Rain Aid, and there's a number of people here that, you know, were participating and collaborated, and, and there were people that were friends, and people that we became friends later, and people that weren't friends, and then I was like, hey, I've seen your work, you great work with visuals, would you like to participate in this, and that worked out really well, and a number of people I met through that, we became friends later on, so it, it's not a requirement, for sure, but respect is really important. I feel the same way as well, I feel like most of my collaborations, um, it, the, it's the collaboration that facilitated a friendship that developed afterwards. Like for most of my collaboration, it's not really about like oh we're friends first and let's collaborate. It's more about the work they do, like first and foremost. And if that aligns with you and that if that speaks to you and makes you want, gives you that passion and drive to like make something happen, then I I, I always go with that first rather than like whether we're friends or not. So yeah. What's the scariest cold call you've ever made that had a positive reaction? <laughs> Is there such a thing in your world or do you get everything you want right away and you know everyone? Is there a scary cold call, a scary ask you're a little nervous about? I don't know. I, what, I mean, for us, the biggest scariest ask is when we asked for the collective initiative funding the factor. And then we went through that whole process. I mean, writing grants is not easy when you first learn how to do it. It takes time to nurture the skills and get the language and understand the language that's used with, you know, funding proposals and stuff. But I think that was a big ask and I was definitely like shaking my boots a little bit like, oh gosh, I'm gonna ask them for thousands of dollars. <laughs> Mom, please, can I have some money? <laughs> and you got it? We don't, we don't want, we won't know, but you it seems know. like we're gonna get <gasps> it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Keep us posted. We will. <laughs> I find like most cold call calls a little bit like, you know, because you're putting yourself out there, you know, if I'm like asking like a company to sponsor my project or like asking like another artist that I admire to work with me, you know, there's always that scary element to it. And I think it's okay to feel that kind of anxiety about that. And I think that's kind of like what makes that collaboration more magical is because it kind of gives you that like risky kind of feeling, you know, like it kind of gives you that butterfly feeling. And, yeah. It's, yeah, it's true. I think, I think it's uh, usually when reaching out to 
uh, artists that I really look up to, say for example, and then I'm kind of like, ooh, this person's really cool, I'd like to work with them. And you know, you don't really know each other that well, so when you reach out to them and they say, yeah, that'd be great, let's work together, that's always been really, really positive. What's the best way? I have, a, I have a project. It's X project doing certain media at such a place at a specific time. And I want to pitch that to an artist uh, or a company that's bigger than me. They're, they're, they're way bigger than me and I'm really afraid to approach them, but I need to make a cold call. Help me make that cold call. What would you do? What's the best way to approach? I'd probably call her. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm delegating this task to someone with better skills than me. <laughs> That's actually a wise answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so There's just certain things I don't like doing. That's definitely one of them. Gotcha. Uh, I call me Andrew do <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. right. I would say present, do your research on the company, like see, like okay, it depends on your kind of partnership with the company too, like what are you asking from the company, are you asking them for a straight up sponsorship, for cash, for money, for equipment, for like artistic sponsorships, for location, so do your research on like whatever collective group that you want to work with, and then um, like I usually, like I always, for every project I do, I have like, like a kind of like a overview package where I kind of like have like a title page, you know, graphics. I get a graphic designer to do, do all this. Um, I like do like a backstory of the project. I do like the artists that are involved, the vision, maybe if there are workshops, I'll like list those workshops and kind of like have like a, you know, like almost like a present, like a PowerPoint presentation, but kind of in a PDF format of that specific project. And then I create a separate page um, that is, that I change for different kinds of uh, companies or like collectors that I have to hit up um, and that page is I, I'll kind of do my research and like look at their target audience and be like okay the target audience for this like AV company is this so I'm gonna position my project in that last page and be like these are the demographics that we're reaching out to da, 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 da. like this is why we align with you and kind of like have that last page be the kind of pitch and have that be different for every single kind of you know person you're cold calling out to. It's kind, of, it's kind of like applying for a job, really. It's like a cover letter. Why do all that prep? Why custom make the pitch? Why why do that? They really, I mean, I can just say with the conference and with the label, and ever, ever since we did the same thing, we make these beautiful pitches that are very customized to each company, and with beautiful imagery, and we hire photographers, and we use all that content that we got from our events to our advantage to promote what it is that we do beautiful fonts and la 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 la. As soon as we started doing that, uh, pe and people started taking us way more seriously. And we basically got everything we asked for. So, okay. uh, what I wanted to get at was, well, by, by kind of, I don't want to say targeting, but targeting uh, your approach and getting to know who it is you want to work with, you can really show where working together would give value to them and enhance what they're doing or the project might move them forward, is that true? So it's not all about our, ourselves, perhaps. We're gonna get something out of it, but it's a real win-win. Is that not what we're going for? Is that fair? I would say yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think it's also important for the people you're asking for help for, for them to feel like, holy shit, this person's been doing the work. They've already done the work, uh, and for us, it's as easy as just signing a check or saying yes, you know? like. You right. want to make it as easy as and as palatable as it, as possible for like the people you're asking for help from. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay. Do you have any uh, pitch ideas or things that help uh, approaching uh, big companies or large organizations or bigger artists? Arsha, have you done that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like basically preparation really shows and coming across as professionals really shows. I actually outside of the DJ life, I organize a information security conference. And you know, this year we had about well, 450 people attend, and we had like sponsorships in the tens of thousands of dollars. And the reason that happened is because we put the effort to put together a really professional sponsorship package. You know, every aspect of it was customized, and that came across to the people that were sponsoring the event. That look, these guys put the effort, and you know, they're not just you know some unprofessional people, and they will, they had to. You know, and they were able to trust us with their dollars that we're going to take this and do something really good with it. So, yeah, be prepared, be professional, it really helps. And it keeps it on brand for them too, right? It's just easy, as you said, they'll just cut the check. <laughs> That's it, they're like, oh, yeah, it looks good, it looks like it's on brand and aligns with our values, let's just give them some money. What was that last part? Aligns with, aligns with our values. Okay. 
Yeah. All right, oh, that's good stuff. Did you say info security? Yes. Have you read my emails? Hacker stuff. <laughs> Maybe. You've been in my bank account. <laughs> oh no. What's Slack? Talk about that shit. <laughs> good. Um, there's a wealth of information up here on the panel, and I'm sure there's also a wealth of experience in the audience. Uh, thank you again for being here today. We're almost at the end of our hour, but I want to get into some Q&A. Because no matter what your project is, and no matter what scale, uh, it doesn't matter how big or small, or how many people you want to work with, if you have something you think uh, you want to air out in this room or ask one of our panelists up here, we're gonna, what I will do is either come to you with a mic or repeat the question so that uh, those who are, thank you, tuning in on Facebook Live from elsewhere, joining us at Base Coast, uh, can hear what's being asked. Does that make sense? I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. You're, you're thinking right now, it's kind of bubbling up inside you, and I mean, we probably have time about oh, four or five questions. I'm just giving you time to get ready in a second I want to see a hand go up. But before we do that, let's just give one big hand to our uh, panelists who are here today. And the team that is here helping make this happen. And if he's here, hey, where is he? Tala, are you here? This was a perfect time. He knew we were ready, and he was ready to go get himself uh, caffeinated. And that's what he's doing. Um, all right, so who's got a quest question for a panelist asking about? Yes, what is your question? What's your name, first of all? Chevy. And I'm just curious, I touched on a little bit at the beginning, but if you're out to a school job and you're getting someone to do a job for you, where's that line? Where's that definition between like a job for you and not doing If you are outsourcing and paying someone to have a result, uh, what's the line between having an employee or a subcontractor and collaborating? Creative freedom. Yeah. Uh, basically, being able to control the situation. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, some collaborations, like with, uh, like with Chapel Sound events, it's like, yeah, we work with graphic designers, but we give them like full creative freedom to do whatever they need to do. So the, you know, just these are the information we need, but you can aesthetically, visually do whatever you want. And I think that is more of a collaborative approach than being like working with, with a marketing agency, for example. Then that's like, you got to do this. They got final say on what gets uh, printed. <laughs> and I, I even think I see this a lot with. Um, with underground parties and promoters, and they say that they're giving you creative freedom, but they want 1,700 revisions on their on their flyer on their Facebook banner. I want it to be artsy, and then you put like a paint splatter, and I'm like, no, I don't want a paint splatter. I want like square paint splatters. Like, okay, <laughs> so you do like all these videos. So I think I think. If you're going to be the one in charge, you just need to be really present to the line within yourself where you go over the edge, where you're suddenly becoming like a controlling it, and it's no longer creative freedom for them. Chevy, did I get to something for you? You got something out of that? Good. Yeah, well, good answers. Good answers. Who's next? We have we have time for a few more. I see a hand up back here. I'm just going to just. I mean, what's your name, first of all? Ria. Ria. Ria, what's your question? What do you do when your collaboration, Ria's question is, what do you do when your collaboration is perhaps going, starting to go in a direction that you didn't intend you were not comfortable with? No? Yeah. Okay, great. Function. Well, I think that's what we were talking about, like having that early initial conversation is really important, right at the beginning of the relationship. But I guess your question is, well, what if you didn't have that initial conversation? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I've been in that situation. That, it's not an easy one. I mean, it's like trying to get a divorce. It's like, well, I'm not happy in this relationship anymore, right? And you got to get out. So there's different ways of handling it. There's bad divorces and there's good divorces that I've been both musically. And, uh, and you know, and it's just how how gracefully you're able to exit. You just kind of have to be like, hey, you know what? Be upfront about it. You know, this is not the vision that I had. And sometimes you may want to fight it out. Like, there's been times where it's just like, where you know, it may be worth for me to stick or not stick it out and like try to work it. But sometimes it's just not worth it, and you need to be like, hey, let's cut our losses and go in different directions musically. And yeah. Ria, did you get something from that? Good. Okay. Good. Awesome. Who's next? Yes, right next door. Yeah. What's your name, my friend? Sabio. Sabio? Yeah. Um, I had a question just about like when you're first starting like a record label, just understanding like the important roles and like the separation of those roles. Sabio is thinking about record labels in particular, and uh, 
how to understand those, how important is understanding the rules within it? Yeah. Well, if you were starting out, yeah. can anybody speak to that? Definitely. <laughs> um, I think it's actually really important to establish rules right off the kicker. And I think it's good to decide at the beginning who is going to be the person, you know, mainly in charge of source, doing the A&R, like sourcing the music and making the final decision about music. Um, and give someone the power to veto stuff. Because the, I think when you get two people that have maybe different tastes, which is exactly what my label is like, which is great. We both come at it from different places, which gives us a really nice variety. But if you're a label that is very specific, and you're going for a very particular aesthetic, it could be really easy to derail really quickly if you don't have someone going, no, 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 and making those decisions really, really quickly. Also, you always need to have someone that will spend the time and learn and understand the royalties of the financing side, the finances side of it, because it's it's a little bit complicated at first, but it's an important role, and it's your job as a label owner is to also educate the artist um, in the money aspect, and so you know you need to have at least one person on your team that's going to spend the time to really get educated in that side of the label, in my opinion. So that answer your question? Joel, you probably have some feedback. Some feedback on that? I was taking notes on what you were saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, collaborative, the great thing about a label is it can be extremely collaborative. In fact, maybe one of the most collaborative projects you could do in a group. But um, I think with A&R, I really do strongly feel like there needs to be someone at the very final end that goes, yes, or no, and, and, yeah. and keeps it on brand, and it's, you always have to trust that one person. Mm. The axe, the axe, <laughs> or the pass. Who's the axe? Do we have another hand up? Yeah, well, we're in the back. What's your name, my friend? Ryan. Ryan. What's your question, Ryan? What, what is A&R? What is A&R? Yeah. Artists and repertoire. And what does that mean? So it's the artist that you're managing, so with all the people, like you guys are like my artists, and then I manage your repertoire. So the repertoire is the music that you write. Yes. So somebody basically who's in charge of... I'm in charge of all your music. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. But not really you. Just who you are as an artist, what's your music in relation to me and my label. <laughs> but again, we're coming back to this, like... I'm not going to think so you have to copy. Right. <laughs> Communication and human relationships with you. Exactly. Executing product projects. Yeah. yeah, sure. Cool. All right. What's A and R? We got that one answered. Thanks, Ryan. Who's next? We got time for a couple more. Who has a project that they need help on? It? Uh, I want to get something out of our incredibly knowledgeable panel uh, before we dive into the party. So I'll be back. I'm really for a follow up. When you've worked with everyone and you need something new, where do you go to fall in love? Artistically. Artistically, right? Okay. The internet. <laughs> Meetups as well. I, yeah, so yeah. I, I go to the internet um, when I, I've exhausted all my resources, generally. Um, the internet is a super resourceful uh, platform. Uh, just for example, like my VR dance film that the, my previous collaborator exited and I was kind of stuck with this project where I've also invested thousands of dollars into already and I needed to move it forward but I didn't have the proper like uh, virtual uh, 360 video cameras. So what I did was I like souped up my website. Um, I like looked onto all the Facebook VR 360 video groups, try to find all their, um, uh, like they have like, they like have they, like all these like groups online have compiled some of them have compiled like resource lists of like all the different people in the industry from like all over North America. So I just like went on Facebook, searched a bunch of like VR groups like all across North America, and then searched and then like did like control find Vancouver, looking for specifically people that working that are working in VR in Vancouver, and just shot them an email. And it, they ended up working. Like the co the company that like I really wanted to work with was like. Sweet, we're super down. So, so usually like cold calls like that. Like if you do your research properly and you know that this is exactly what they do, um, it could be quite a successful kind of thing. Sweet, yeah, the internet, Tinder for creatives. Yeah, right? it's like everywhere. Question: What was it you said? Meetups? 
Yeah, I mean, or community groups, right? So, for example, your groundwork is a really good example. If you're, oh, thank you're you. looking to get into production or meet production partners, you go to one of the groundwork meetups, or similarly in, in different areas, go to a community where there are others that are doing that type of other stuff, and by virtue of by networking with them, you'll meet others. Uh, as a shameless plug, we are the fourth Wednesday of the month at the Hansa Club in Vancouver, starting in September, we take a break for festival season. But we meet once a month, and uh, it's not just for producers, it's for anyone who's interested in electronic music and finding communities of, of cool people, much like Base Coast. Um, but there's about 80 to 100 of us that get together every month, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, and a lot of projects have spawned from that, uh, just from having a place to meet face-to-face. Uh, can't, cannot, um, I overstate the importance of that. I think the internet is super powerful too. It allows us to go far, but uh, having places to gather in person uh, incredibly important. Um, is there a question that you have for each other and one of the family that you would want to know now that you're all sitting in a room together? And if you have that, and, and while you think of that, I'm going to go back to one last question from the audience. So we have time for one more, and we're double dipping again. Sherry, what you got? Sure. Do you find that it's generally uh, surrounded with a certain subgenre of electronic music, or we get a fair amount of house and techno? Yeah. Um, however, uh, there's always two or three incredible drum and bass tracks. There's some really uh, some incredible liquid drum and bass coming through lately. For the hour half time, we're getting a bit more trap. Um, there's like ambient. Filmic, oh, there's one of the artists I'm thinking in particular, uh, that rectifier, and he just turns his machines on and records it, and it sounds like aliens landing, and he should be scoring sci fi films. So it's like, and there's chill out, there's down tempo, there's, there's really quite a range uh, from, I would say mostly underground, but uh, some of it touches on the commercial and other things as well. And for us, it's, it's what we get, it's what we get submitted that gets played, so it's really up to the people who want to contribute. Uh, we're, we're really just amazed with the music that comes in. At, at, for us, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it fits under the electronic moniker in some way. Um, I mean, every one of us has our own preferences, but that's not what this is about. It's about what shows up on the day. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, just, we're just interested to honestly promote uh, and meet with people in Vancouver and put that network together because it's so easy to be an introvert and sit by yourself with a computer and a laptop and your and your copy of Ableton for years um, and never actually uh, look someone else in the eye and show them what you've been working on. And for many people it's the first time they've heard it out loud uh, on a big PA and that is an incredible learning tool if you practice it over and over again as many people are finding. Enough about us but thank you for that leading question. Uh, do our panelists have any questions for each other? And it's fine if you don't. Okay, if we put, if we put all of you on a project, who would be the boss? She would be the boss. <laughs> Nancy Lee for the win. I would like, like willingly submit to her. <laughs> yeah, you are here first. She's a bad bitch, I can tell right now. 16 million people watching that's, Facebook Live. That's, that's the thing though, that's actually a great thing about collaboration is, is recognizing when someone has something to show you. And standing back and going, look, I can learn something from this person. That's really important. Step down, sit down, and shut up and learn. <laughs> right? Um, oh, I'm super <laughs> flattered. <laughs> it's recognizing your strengths and weaknesses, and then recognizing when someone has a strength that you don't, and then let them be in that position. I think that's really important. Nice. So it also takes knowing yourself to this degree as well. Yeah. yeah. Also, Nancy knows what Slack is. <laughs> question for the panelists. Um, like for me, like how do you guys figure out where your limitations are in terms of your boundaries? I mean for me, that's kind of hard. Like I can turn any project into a work project. Like if I, my friends are like, why don't you like join curling for recreation? And I'm just like, you know, I probably will start curling tournaments and conferences. <laughs> that's, right. Right. Yeah. No, that's the thing. Is like, we're the types of people that just take everything from to rate to level 11. No. And we can't say no. So we're, there's probably a lot of you like that in the crowd. Like you're, you're doers. You're, Doing it, you're, you're doing it. My best friend Jess was at my set last night, at six in the morning. She hadn't been out to one of the festivals with me for a long time, but she, I looked down and she's just like, "You're doing it!" And uh, it was kind of a great moment, but really, it's quite 
like a reflection of my life, like just doing it all too much. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is when you have to sleep. That's when. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. But when, the, when you're doers, so you're not just gonna do. You're not just gonna like join a soccer team. You're gonna yeah. organize the team next, and then you're gonna be having a World Cup. <laughs> you know, that's that's who people like us are. Uh, to wrap up. Um, just a little anecdote that happened the last week. I was really lucky and fortunate to get selected, along with Andrew Williams here, to um, do a, a master class at the National Music Center in Calgary with Richie Houghton, who is a, uh, a well-known Canadian techno icon. Um, we got to spend a day with him, and, and it, was, it was really great. He was really personable, and he listened really well. He was really there with us, I felt like, uh, and just completely dropped his ego. It was really wonderful. A question I had for him was, do we, I was like, you moved to Berlin, Richie, do we all have to move to Berlin? Like, if we want to go further, do we need to leave where we are, and do we need to go to one of these centers that everyone knows of? And his answer was no. And he looked me right in the eye, and he said, uh, no, just find a group of people that you can work with, that are on the same mission, and do shit. And put me here, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, he was much more eloquent. Uh, but, but work together and work towards these things and self-amplify and amplify each other and build where you are and move when you're spending too much time on the plane. But I thought that really spoke to the power of uh, what collaboration can do and how far it can go no matter where you are, where you're from, what your resources are, uh, as long as you find the people around you who you can get excited with. Is that fair? I want to thank Isis Graham, Nancy and Parsha Debassi for being here today. Uh, they all DJed in the last 12 hours, I think, yeah? So or tomorrow. Sunday Soul Sessions tomorrow, come on by. Anybody got this stuff to play? To one. Where was that? Cantina? Cantina Stage 10 to 1, Sunday Soul Sessions. There there one. One. Also, just another plug, uh, if you guys are in Vancouver Friday, we're doing Cats Only Club uh, with uh, Low Indigo and Chapel Sound. I'll, DJ, I'll be DJing at the Backstage Lounge in Vancouver on Friday. Oh, my plug? <laughs> Your plug is coming up? Um, I, yeah, nope. well, I'm, I'm playing at Astral Harvest next Friday if you're coming out to there. But, um, yeah, come to the Alberta Electronic Music Conference in Calgary in November, November 16th to the 19th. And we have stickers that are like mini mugs over there. Get one. <laughs> I highly recommend the conference if it's at all interest of interest to you. Yeah. I highly, highly, highly it's, recommend it. If you enjoyed this little session today, it will be a much more you know less dirty, clean. We'll be more well rested. <laughs> it will be two full days of that and actual music production workshops and then a full two nights or three or four nights actually worth of, of entertainment all in Calgary's best venues and then it's at the daytime stuff is at the National Music Center, which is a crazy spot if you haven't been. It's incredible. Uh, as for us, Groundwork, we're back in the fall, meeting on the fourth Wednesday of the month at the Anza Club. Uh, we do a listening party, so we have a keynote, someone from the industry giving us uh, some, some knowledge, something, they, something they're good at, and sharing that passion with us. And then we listen to about 20 or 25 new tracks made by producers who show up in the room that you can then go get to meet and develop relationships and peer-to-peer -peer mentorship with. And we found that I mean, there's some of you here who I've been so lucky to meet in the last two years that are now really good friends and collaborators uh, just because we decided we want to do a thing. Uh, also check out here in Vancouver, uh, Secret Pop-Up Party Public Disco launching this summer. Uh, speaking of silos and projects, Nick Collin in here is leading the charge on that one. That's going to be super fun, activating outdoor spaces during the daytime. So if you're in Vancouver, drop by when you see those announced. Thank you so much for being here tonight. A uh, big hand for our audience. Everybody. Yeah, yeah.